In all major cities around the world, the arteries are clogged and space is lacking to create new infrastructures. In transportation, as in energy supply, the smart trend for cities is to use precise digital information to optimize flows and send more and more people down the same paths. But how can one drive the movements of individuals, like electrons, in a network? In London, personalized transportation cards that are validated at the start and end of every journey have been introduced to precisely follow the flow of passengers across the network. So once we automate the payment systems through smart cards here in London, the Oyster card, then the data uh, when people are charged is available to us and that gives us some sense of how people are using the system. So to some extent, the idea of the smart city is to actually take uh, what's being sensed using these various sensors and computers uh, and actually interpret them so that we can actually uh, make the systems better in some way. Michael Batty designs dynamic city mapping for urban institutions. Thanks to Oyster Card data, this animation converts the multitude of individual trips into flows running through the arteries and underlines periods of heavy traffic from minute to minute over a week. The morning rush hour and 5 p.m. peak and the little residual rush at 11 p.m. bear witness to Londoners' cultural and festive outings. Well, we call this the pulse of the city. It's the kind of routine, it's the heartbeat of the city in that sense. Michael Batty's animated maps aren't just pretty to look at. They help the transportation companies to understand the scale of the problems they need to resolve. London's population is growing. The demand for the tube network is increasing. It's roughly 5% year on year, and we have got to make sure that we provide enough capacity on the network in order to be able to handle the number of people that want to use our system. Now, the only way that we can manage that is with computer technology. We've got away from manually driving trains to the computer driving trains, understanding where all the other trains on the line are in relation to it, and making very detailed adjustments to balance that. This automated underground ballet that is controlled by one central computer has allowed the flow rate to increase by 20 to 30 percent without making any infrastructure changes. When adapting the offer to the demand will no longer do, the demand gets adapted to the offer. During rush hour, to avoid total saturation of the trains, the underground increases prices by 50 percent on average in order to dissuade the least motivated or most poor passengers. And if the ticketing machines are slower than usual, it's because they've been informed of crowding on the platform and are holding back the flow of passengers higher up. The supervisor and the control room are watching the numbers of people. They're making sure they match the number of gates that are open to allow people in, the signs that we have around the station to direct people, because we can reroute people if we want to. If the platforms get a little bit crowded, and we can reroute people and maybe take a little longer to get to those platforms. So there's lots of little ways that we can do this. At the exit to the underground, you might think that each person decides alone where they're going. But here, too, smart city planning subtly directs our choices to guide our movements. In London, the Oxford Circus Junction enjoys the densest pedestrian population in the country, and it is impossible to move the walls of these historic monuments. Well, Oxford Circus was pedestrian hell. It was a terrible place to come if you were a pedestrian. Large numbers of pedestrians come to Oxford Circus, 30 to 40,000 an hour, and we have about 19,000 passengers coming in and out of the tube station. Given this somewhat nightmarish situation, 
the city council and local businesses had an idea to speed up the pace of pedestrians. But how to do that without slowing down the road traffic? For Atkins, a company specializing in urban modeling, the first phase of the operation consisted of creating a digital replica of the junction, complete with virtual citizens, to try out all possible solutions. The first step, really, is to understand all of that movement that needs to happen at the junction um, by means of, of surveying and observing um, how people are passing through the space. We model um, individual types of vehicles because the way in which they pass through the junction is different, obviously. But modeling the movement of pedestrians is the most tricky part of the process. How to program 40,000 virtual people so their behavior corresponds to real passers-by in Oxford Circus. James Amos designed the program used to model the junction. After spending hundreds of hours observing pedestrians walking around, he seized upon three parameters that would enable him to recreate every crowd in the world. When a person is um, looking where to step next and planning their route, uh, they consider three things that uh, they've got a destination that they want to go to. Everybody has a preferred speed at which they'd like to walk. And people like to keep a distance around them, so everybody has a, a personal space that they like to keep around them. And so balancing those factors out determines where people step and how they make progress. Then he had to personalize the avatars using these three parameters so that the proportion of tourists, casual workers, and local residents corresponded to those found at Oxford Circus. A tourist may try to keep more space around them and walk more slowly um, than a commuter who just wants to get there as quickly as possible, doesn't mind you know, rubbing up against other people to get there. Once a model corresponding to reality was obtained, the modification of the virtual junction could begin, as could the observation of its impact on the digital guinea pigs. So it's about making small changes to the design to get the best out of Oxford Circus. You might think very small changes in terms of where the curbs were or where the crossings were could make quite big differences. And that's how the perfect curve for the sidewalks was determined, to shorten the time it takes pedestrians to cross without slowing down turning buses. And even crossing the road away from official crossing points is less rebellious than one might think. They were suggested by the algorithms to free up the junction. We call these perch points. It's an opportunity for pedestrians to cross informally. So in, we think it's quite important that if someone sees a gap in the traffic, they want to cross the road, they don't have to use the traffic signal, but they can make use of these perch points. The nice thing about these perch points is when someone's crossing the street, if you don't have them, they're in the centre of the street and they're worried about the traffic. But the pride of Atkins is the diagonal crossing. Every two minutes, the road traffic is stopped completely, and pedestrians can now cross the junction in one go from corner to corner. We predicted that, on average, people would be able to walk through Oxford Circus around 50 seconds quicker than they did before. And we, we have done some surveys that have basically uh, corroborated that. And a countdown incites people not to waste a single precious second of transit time, because time is money, as those local businesses who finance speeding up the flow know only too well. The scheme paid for itself within six months. So the investment of about four and a half million pounds in this project was paid back for in terms of the retail activity that increased. I think that looking down from above, you know, a bird's eye view or a god's eye view on these complex adaptive patterns of live 
dynamic elements that are people moving through the city, I think that's a beautiful thing. I think it's, it's enticing in exactly the same way that watching any natural complex system is. But as a citizen, um, I don't believe that flows can be optimized. Cities are not about optimization. They're not about efficiency. They're about friction. They're about mess and complication. And they're about rubbing up against the different. I think that when you apply the engineering mindset to the terrain that is the contemporary city, you run the very real risk of engineering out of that system all of the things that generate meaning and vitality and what we understand as city magic.